Jasmine? Yeah. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Alejandra Almarza, Director of the UEF uh, Secretariat. Thank you for being here at the second session of our UEF's final conference, Democracy is Europe, Remember to Revive. As you know, UEF embarked on this journey, on this project one year ago. And with this final conference, we aim at looking back on the um, outcomes of this project, but not only. Uh, on one hand, and in line with what we did in our previous events, um, we are raising awareness of the central role that European values played in the revolutions of 1989-1991 in uh, Central, and Central and Eastern Europe. Um, on the other hand, we are encouraging a reflection on the future of Europe, democracy, and the rule of law. Um, for this session, which we named Defending and Strengthening Democracy in the EU, Article 7 of the Treaty of the European Union, and conditionality, we will be exploring uh, what the Article 7 procedure to suspend certain rights from a member state means, why it was triggered in relation to Poland and Hungary, and what's the impact of the rule of law conditionality regulation that entered into force on the 1st of January 2021. Just to make sure that we are all on the same page uh, for the discussion, I would like to mention three important um, development events. Um, after this conditionality regulation entered into force this year, um, Hungary and Poland launched legal action at the European Court of Justice uh, against this uh, mechanism which links EU funds uh, to the protection uh, of the rule of law. Um, then when we were in Dansk for our event, we learned about the ruling of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal um, that once again put into question the primacy of the EU law and uh, therefore undermining the rule of law in Poland and in Europe. Some of our participants in Dansk will remember that discussion. And just today, as our president mentioned, the top lawyer of the European Court of Justice um, issued an opinion and basically, well, he said that the, this mechanism uh, is appropriate uh, from a legal perspective and is based on, on a good basis, on a good legal basis. Um, so with this being said, um, I would like, it is my pleasure, and I would like to introduce to you our four excellent um, speakers. Um, on behalf of UEF uh, and our participants today, we would like to warmly welcome you and thank you for your time and knowledge uh, today. Um, the first uh, speaker that I have on my list, well, I have two speakers that come from the institutions. The first one will join us later. He's Mr. Juan Fernando López Aguilar. Um, he's the chair of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, the LIBE Committee in the European Parliament. He's been an MEP since 2009, and among other remarkable things, he's former uh, Minister of Justice of the Government of Spain. Then on the European Commission side, we have Mr. Nicolas Bell. He's a lawyer and currently Justice Policy and Rule of Law Deputy Head of Units uh, in the Directorate General for Justice and Consumers, DG Just, who has served in the Commission for almost 20 years. Um, from the academia world and the civil society, we have Mrs. Anya Skripek. Anya, forgive me if I haven't pronounced your family name right. Um, she's the director for research and training at the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, FEPS. Uh, she's been there for 12 years. Uh, she holds a PhD cum laude in political science from the University of Warsaw, which degrees she obtained for her thesis cooperation of the socialist and social democratic parties in uniting Europe. Last but not least, uh, we have a physical speaker with us. He is Mr. Edouard Godot. He's a historian, former political advisor for the Greens EFA uh, in the European Parliament for the group. Um, he's the author of several books, such as Pour la planète, l'Europe c'est nous, et manifeste des écologies à terre. Uh, sorry for my French pronunciation. And among his civil society commitments, he's the uh, director for external relations of the Association Europa Nova. 
So I will first give the floor to Mr. Nicolas Bell from the European Commission. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for um, organizing this discussion and uh, for inviting the Commission to it. And perhaps I could start with a, a broader picture. The European Union is a community of values, which is enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union. And these values include human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. And the rule of law has a particular significance in this list, as it guarantees the protection of all the other fundamental values, including democracy and respect for fundamental rights. Without the rule of law, there can be no democracy or respect for fundamental rights. And respect for the rule of law is important for the very functioning of our union. Threats to the rule of law challenge the legal, political, economic basis of the EU. And deficiencies in one member state have an impact on other member states and on the EU as a whole. Respect for the rule of law is also at the core of the functioning of our internal market and of cooperation among member states in the area of justice. The cooperation which is based on mutual trust between member states. And last but not least, rule of law and respect for it is also essential for the protection of the financial interests of the union. And unfortunately, respect for the rule of law cannot be taken for granted, not even within our union. And over the past years, we have seen rule of law concerns emerging in certain member states and this is a very worrying development. The Commission has gradually developed and used during the last years a variety of tools and instruments to address these challenges. Some of these tools focus on promotion of the rule of law. Some are aimed at prevention of rule of law problems and some provide an effective response when breaches of the rule of law have materialized and promotion or prevention have proved insufficient. Last year, a new tool was added to the Commission's rule of law toolbox, if I may say, and that is the European rule of law mechanism, a yearly cycle with the annual rule of law report the annual rule of law report at its center. It is aimed at promoting the rule of law in all member states and at preventing challenges from emerging or deepening. The 2021 rule of law report was published in July last year and we are now already working on next year's edition. Also, the Commission publishes every year the Justice Scoreboard, which is an annual report providing comparable and reliable data about the functioning of the national justice systems, and in particular their independence, their quality, and uh, their efficiency. And importantly, the Commission also uses financial programs to support civil society. Um, to support judicial networks and specific projects to strengthen the effectiveness of the national justice systems. But they're not only preventive tools at our disposal, also response tools. And one of the most well known is probably the infringement procedure, which allows the Commission to bring a case before the Court of Justice if a member state has violated its obligations 
under EU law. And in the context of infringement procedures, the Court of Justice can also impose interim measures and even upon request of the Commission, impose financial penalties on a member state as the court has recently done in the case of Poland. You also mentioned uh, the Article 7 procedure, Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union, which provides for a special mechanism with potentially far-reaching sanctions in case a member state does not respect the fundamental values which are referred to in Article 2 of the treaty which include the rule of law. The voting rights of the member state concerned can be suspended by the council. And currently, Poland and Hungary are subject to this procedure, which is still ongoing in the council. And later this month, the council will again discuss the situation of the rule of law in Poland and Hungary, and the commission will continue to assist the Council in that respect in the context of this procedure. And it is important that the Council remains seized of this procedure until all the underlying causes that led to the triggering of these procedures have been addressed. Finally, another tool to the rule of law toolbox was added the new regulation on a general regime of conditionality for the protection of the budget. You also refer to it in your introduction. And this regulation, this regime, allows the Commission to propose measures to the Council to protect the Union's budget in case of breaches of the principles of the rule of law, in case these breaches affect or seriously risk affecting the sound financial management of the union budget in a sufficiently direct way. Under this new regime, in appropriate cases, payments of EU funds to the member state concerned can, for example, be suspended. This regulation, this regime entered into force on the 1st of January this year, and the Commission has been monitoring possible breaches of the rule of law that would be relevant under the regulation since day one. In parallel, the Commission has been preparing guidelines to ensure that this mechanism is applied in a fair, objective, and proportionate way. And the Commission will start the procedure under this regime in a concrete case if all the conditions for its application are fulfilled. And the Commission has also made clear to the European Parliament that it fully agrees that the regulation must be applied in full and the Commission will continue to do so. As you know, Hungary and Poland have contested the validity of this regulation before the Court of Justice and indeed today the Advocate General came with an opinion in this case arguing that the regulation is fully valid and rejecting the claims of Poland and Hungary. And we will now have to wait for the judgment of the Court of Justice, which we expect early uh, next year. And needless to say, the Commission is strongly convinced of the validity of this regulation, and it will take into account the judgment of the Court when applying it and when finalizing its guidelines on the application. To conclude, the Commission, as the guardian of the treaties, will continue to use all the tools and instruments at its disposal to promote the rule of law and to uphold it within the EU. And in this respect, the cooperation with the European Parliament is very important. Promoting and upholding the rule of law is a joint responsibility of all EU institutions and of member states, and of stakeholders, citizens, civil society. As the European Parliament is concerned, it has a very important role of play, a very important role to play, and 
it is fully playing that role. And we'll hear more from Mr. Lopez Aguilar uh, later this afternoon um, to have this confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. You were perfectly on time. Um, thank you very much for your intervention and for making sure that our participants listen to the European Commission's uh, position. It's very important for us. By the way, for <clears throat> our online speakers, we have 25 participants in at our venue. So just so you know, because I think you cannot really see it. Um, so they are mainly students, but they are they come from different European. Uh, member states and uh, from different backgrounds. So just so you know, um, our next speaker, I think Lopez Aguilar is not yet in the waiting room or in the room, no? Okay, so we, I'll give the floor to Mrs. Ms. Anya. Um, thank you very much, Alejandra. And it's a privilege to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I also had uh, an honor to join you in Gdańsk, though also virtually. Um, and I think that the project that you are bringing to a grand finale today uh, is incredibly important. And as uh, uh, Mr. Bell has already explained, uh, coincidence of today's uh, uh, discussion and uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the explanation vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the European Union position um, at the moment on the level of opinion is on the conditionality couldn't be better coincided. I think that's precisely what makes federalists be exactly at where the heart of the debate is beating. And um, uh, please allow me to use the next couple of minutes uh, to just explain how I uh, would uh, perhaps add just a couple of cents to the discussion that is already very rich. Um, I come from Poland as uh, announced, which of course makes the discussion uh, also uh, extremely personal for me, um, because uh, having lived uh, already in Belgium for such a long time, um, I have been seeing in the uh, last years, the relations only getting more and more tense. Um, and um, I would say that especially on the day like today, it is incredibly difficult to take a position on this discussion, um, but I am not going to hesitate whatsoever. I think that the Europeans, European Union's role in this discussion is absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, I would say that the strong commitment, as has been just explained, to the question of how to preserve the European Union as the community of value, how to give it the sense, the idea that we seek for something that embodies the idea of democracy with no exception, is something that in 2003 triggered my transition generation to go and vote yes for being the members of the European Union that made us campaign. And I do hope that uh, following this conversation will also be understood uh, across Poland, Hungary, Slovenia, and other cases where the rule of law is being in fact uh, strained as uh, something absolutely indispensable. Um, I want to say uh, a few words in three contexts, and I know that I have a very limited amount of time, but I think you know the purpose of this kind of uh, meetings is a debate. Uh, we um, in the hybrid format, it's always very, very difficult. I uh, additionally sit in quarantena, which is not fashionable at all, but happens to us all these days. I would have loved to be uh, there at the spot. Uh, but uh, um, all the same, I feel extremely connected with the exchange. And let me just uh, add the uh, um, <laughs> following points. Um, I think, uh, uh, especially when, uh, you know, when we discuss the issue, and uh, uh, Mr. Bell has been alluding to that, um, the European community as uh, the community of values, I think it has to be really understood across right. the board. Um, of course, the rule of law has been at the center of the discussion, um, but it's not the only discussion that we are having about what the European Union should consist. And I think in Poland, the, one of the problems in Poland, Hungary, and in the other member states that come into the conflict when it comes to the European Union understanding of what community of values is, is the fact that they somehow get to think that they have a right to apply the rules selectively. So uh, when it comes to the question of solidarity, I mean, only recently we have seen a very strange situation which continues and persists on the eastern borders, and then solidarity is understood as a matter of convenience. When there is a demand now to um, 
allocate and transfer the money within the next generation EU. The argument is being used that the European Union is blind on the fact that not transferring the funds can cause economic and hence social problems inside of the EU. Um, there is a lot of a discussion about uh, you know, Poland's right to self-determination without understanding what a right to self-determination means when you belong to the community like the European Union, and that in fact, by belonging, it is even more enhanced. And I think that um, the position of the European Union and this uh, very strong and very strong hope is important because it sends a message for the generation now and for the generations into the, in the future that there is no bargaining on the values and there is no possibility to be selective. European Union is not a cash machine where you withdraw whenever you want. It is a community which is to ensure that the life of each and everyone is going to be better, more prosperous, and that the societies will be fairer for each and everyone. And that can only happen where all the values across the board are applicable in the same way. So um, I think that uh, here the European Union's point is extremely strong. It's treaty related, but it's also hardcore means related. I mean, for years and years, we have been discussing that, you know, what's economic, it's a hard law, what's social and other, it's a soft law. And I think that uh, we are here with at the defining point where European Union says to the countries like Poland and to the societies like Poland, there is no discrepancy. It's one community, one set of rules, one set of standards, and everybody needs to uphold them as a high. The second thing is the question of political standing and the credibility. I mean, I am fortunate enough as a, as a Brussels bureaucrat, uh, for some way one could say, uh, to be asked frequently for the different analytical opinions, usually at the end of the week on the Polish radio, somewhere at 11.30 in the night. That's uh, when the European Union counts as a topic usually for the discussion. But I still feel very privileged to do that. And week after week, I'm being asked in how far the European Union will blink. You know, uh, there has been a lot of discussion if the issues that are now at hand can be sorted out in a political manner. And I think it is important that what has been explained and also Mr. Bell referred to is that the standards are not a matter of political bargaining. And this must be an important signal sent also to the country. And Mr. Bell spoke about the need of uh, interrelating with political stakeholders and, uh, um, and uh, civil society. Um, but I do think that it's an important thing to say that this is not a question of, you know, shouting at the European Union, which we have seen inside of the European Parliament in a very unprecedented way. It's not a question of uh, making this sort of staging you know, the uh, commissioner uh, uh, Reinders arrived to Poland and receives from the, uh, from the Minister uh, for uh, Justice the picture of Warsaw in ruins as a sort of a metaphor of what the European Union is doing to the current government. This is what, is what cannot be allowed, as also what cannot be allowed is the sort of a quasi-militaristic uh, uh, narrative that we have seen from, uh, from those sides of, uh, of the political spectrum. I think it is very clear those are the rules, and I think it's a legal position. It is important to say that it cannot be banned for the sake of one or another political group. I think it is important because only yesterday I was at a discussion with uh, people from the progressive cir circles who were saying, well, you know, but the European Union standing means that even if in two years time we would be able to get into the government, we will receive a very much of a ruined economy. So in the end, it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, playing also against us. And um, I can't find possibly the words of, to explain how wrong this kind of a position is. It is not a matter of political doing, it's a matter of doing what's right. And what's right is evidently clear. And here, let me come to the conclusion with the third point. I think the European Union's position in the issue of conditionality and the application of the treaty has an important social context to it. Because when we are discussing the question of the disciplinary chamber, we are discussing the prosecution of what, who should be the independent judges. We are discussing the undermining of the political, of the judicial system that should not be subordinated to the political powers, should not be subordinated to the whatever I want to do from the side of the Minister of Justice, who, by the way, happens also to be the Prosecutor General. We cannot be agreeing on the thing that on one side you promote the judges who are more lenient to the political, to the current political trend, and on the other... I think I have just gotten censored.
Yeah, my, my voice is louder. I'm not going to be dismissed by, uh, by a sort of a technical glitch. Um, because I think that the part of persecuting judges is the part of generally destroying any sort of authority and respect inside of the society. If you look what happened to the judges and disciplinary chamber is the end of a very long process, is a process that essentially undermined the authority of law inside of the country. They have been undermined together with teachers, together with doctors, together with different pillars on which the country is standing on. And I do think that, uh, you know, for the citizens, and many of them have been extremely pro-European, it is extremely important that this sort of uh, vindictive, um, revenge-oriented approach to justice, subordinating and depriving people from a right to a just political system to the just political to the just uh, uh, process it cannot be politicized and it cannot be allowed this kind of development and the european union stopping that now being the last hope for so many in poland hungary and elsewhere the european union putting the stop now means that for only from that point should that be the turning one the recovery of societal processes could begin and by the way this is not going to happen to tomorrow the respect for judges is not going to be brought in by tomorrow, even if Poland acknowledges the penalties, even if it pays the fines, and even if it backs off from the disciplinary changes, it, chamber. Because the changes that have been effectuated are the ones who are affect, affecting the real people, the judges who have served in the judicial system in the best of their consciousness, and today are being either suspended or persecuted or penalized in whichever way possible. And this all, these three points, the question of values, the question of political standing being strong and not allowing any sort of manipulation or getting scared, the issue of the social context is incredibly important because, you know, Alejandra, you started with, this is part of the contribution to the conference on the future of Europe. The country I come from still has on the statistics one of the highest level of Euro enthusiasts. But those Euro enthusiasts are so incredibly fed up hearing that they need to have trust, that they need to believe that the European Union will be there. But if we want all exit not to happen, if we want to continue believing that it's a community of values, but community of citizens, I think the strong standing from side of the European Union is incredibly important. And I'm finishing this speech and not knowing if it's a Chatham House rule or not. If it is not, I'm expecting lots of trolling to my greatest delight to follow uh, this conversation. Thank you, Anya. Um, it is not, but um, yeah. Thank you very much. You're always very bold in your interventions. Uh, it's not the first time that we have Anya on board. She was also a speaker in our event in, in Dansk. Um, and I'm really happy that, uh, that you join us today. And I'm glad that you mentioned the conference on the future of Europe and that you mentioned again the community of values. Um, because as you know, UEF is, um, of course, advocating you know, for the Conference on the Future of Europe for to be a, a three uh, exercise, democratic exercise. And the community of values, the cash machine that is not, and Anya mentioned, of course, is something that we mentioned in our um, policy papers. So um, I'll take the opportunity to invite you all to uh, check our proposals in the platform of the Conference on the Future of Europe and um, like those proposals. So just so you know. And I think Mr. Lopez Aguilar is not here yet. Mariona, no? Okay. So I'll give the floor to Edouard. Edouard, please, the floor is yours. Got it. Still a rookie, yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to to speak with you. I was uh, having a glance at the the birth date, and um, I felt very old, suddenly. Um, but it's well, it's all I'm used to it. I'm a former teacher, so I should. Um, I, I I think this is very interesting. I mean, that we we have so many ways. It's like the elephant, you know. We have so many ways to describe what we're dealing with democracy in Europe. 
that um, I'm going to follow up on the, the first one that has been taken, the first path that has been taken. I think that we should not, this is a caveat, a disclaimer if you prefer, I think that we should not reduce, not reduce, but we should not, not only define democracy as um, what we've been using so far, rule of law, community of values and so far, because I think this is just one little tiny bit of the galaxy that we're dealing with. But I'm going to start from here because this is where we landed. And I'm going to start with what um, Anya left us with uh, to make um, three very provocative political statements, if you allow me. Um, the first one is, uh, uh, Anya, you said, um, and very rightly, I think, there is an expectation that the European Union will stand up at some point and, well, connect with the people who are still believing that what they're doing is is um, um, upholding the community of value. My first political provocative statement is that we're making a mistake, a categorical mistake, when we talk about community and values because we focus on the wrong word. We focus on values all the time. And I think that we should focus on community rather than values. Let me explain this. The first one is that values are very perspectivist. You know, values, especially in Europe, um, they can be interpreted in many different ways. Europe in itself is the product of very contradictory values. It's the continent on which slavery and enlightenment were developed. This is a, con this is a, a, a continent on which inquisition and um, human rights were also developed. I mean, I'm talking as an historian, as you say, huh? I mean, I'm, talking the, I'm taking the, the, the deep, deep depth that we have in the European history. We've been always, always, um, hovering between unity and diversity, um, fighting war and peace. I mean, not just Tolstoy, but the entire European history is all about that. And, and if you go up, 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 and up uh, to the very beginnings of Europe, it starts with something that is extremely ambivalent. Eh? I'm not going to qualify it because I'm not a judge, but the story of Europe being taken away by the bull is not exactly a, a very nice story. So we can put it in very nice ways, and this is where I want to come. I mean, values are something that really can people that people can die opposing for opposing values within the same thing. So this being said, uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have shared values, like we have shared history, but this is exactly where the problem is 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 being fought by the very people that we are dealing with, and I've. I've learned Paul, I've known Europe from Warsaw in Poland uh, with a very, very uh, important and, and, and fantastic European mind who, whose name was Bronislav Geremek, who passed away about uh, 14 years ago now, well, almost 14 years ago. Um, and this is where, where we probably, do, so I know a little bit what's going on in Poland, uh, not as well as the Polish person, but um, what I'm seeing is that they're fighting for values too. They're fighting for values that we may disagree. But the problem is not that we, we disagree on the values. The problem is that we disagree on the fact that we make a community. And that's, that's where the problem is most of the time hurting. Because as, and this is the second um, uh, question that I wanted to pose, um, the, the real issue is, and this is what the, 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 this is what we should. This is a question that we should an, try to answer most of the time. Geremek used to say, um, "The question is, why do we want to live together?" And common values won't be enough. It's not enough. Um, what you need to know. I mean, we all know. I mean, we can have common values. Doesn't mean that we have the same projects. Doesn't mean that we have the same the same uh, uh, desires. The same um, the same projections. So this is what we need to do. This is a second pro uh, um, um, provocative statement that I want to, um, to, to put on the table, is that um, we need to have a, a real political discussion on what the European project, not values, project is about. Because this is something that is not taken up, and we're talking about democracy, right? Uh, this is not something that is, that is transpiring enough. Um, this is the reason why the national democratic project is very clear to anyone living in a nation. But the European one is still being discussed. Of course, this is a, not, not a nation, of course, not, nor a state, but this is a community in the making. And a community in the making still needs to put forward 
always and discuss it always on common places, common forums and agoras, what the common project is about. There are many, many reasons to unite Europe, many. Um, it can be a matter of size because you, size matters in globalization. Why not? I'm not sure this is not mine, but that, that, that makes sense. It could be also a matter of protection. It could be also a fortress. I mean, the far right has a political project for Europe. It's called Fortress Europe. And it works quite well, actually. It has a lot of influence on the center right as well. So that's the second thing. We need to discuss the project. The project has been discussed only time and again, you know, in 92, for instance, in France and Denmark during a referendum, it was discussed about the Maastricht referendum. Then in 2005, it was also very well fought, at least in the four countries that held a referendum. In the other ones, not so much. That's the real question that we need to ask. Why do we want to live together? Therefore, we focus on the community, not the values. And the third thing is that we need to make sure that Learn, uh, that Europe is learned, not taught, and it's completely different. We teach Europe way too much, whether from the institutional point of view, or the academic point of view, or even the political point of view. Basically, the idea is we need to tell people what Europe is about. I think this is the wrong approach, not just because I, I spend too much time in the political corridors of the European Parliament, knowing that this is the approach that we were taking and that it was just yielding not exactly what we wanted, but also because I've seen it also in, in the classrooms. I'll give you one example. When I was a teacher, year 10, um, 2005, uh, sorry, 2001, 2002, 2002, there was what we call the trauma of having Jean-Marie Le Pen in the second round of the presidential election. Now we got, it, we got very used to it, so that's fine. But in 2002, it was still a trauma for my, my 15, 16 year old students. And we had a little debate and instead of dis discussing on far right and all this, uh, we discussed on Europe. I said, well, the first thing that's going to happen is that the denunciation of the treaties. So let's have a discussion. And what I saw appearing is not a, was not a cleavage on I'm nationalist, I'm French against Europe, etc. No, not at all. It was a, a, a division amongst the people who were confident in life and the people who were not. My good students were all for Europe and my less so good students were all you know, quite reluctant. This is what it's about. We need to learn, look, Europe is not a discipline. It's not a, an academic matter only, of course it is, but it's not only that. It's an experience, it's learning, it's learning what it means to be outside of your comfort zone, no, knowing what it is to, to be, I mean, you know that, but how many, how many youth, how many not so young, not so young people know that? Uh, when I started my, my studies about 30 years ago, Erasmus was a thing. It was a very, very confidential one. I didn't do an Erasmus. I started learning Europe when I started working uh, for Geremek in 2004 in Warsaw. See, that's a lot of time before that. So I'm just saying that we need new channels to learn Europe to make sure that it's just not a sociology driven thing. Because Erasmus is fantastic, but let's face it, it's a drop in the sea. And we need to have more drops if we want to have the sea. So I'm just con going to conclude on this. Um, we need to come back to the essence of democracy. I know it sounds very pompous, but what is democracy? The democracy is two things. And in those two things, one, word comes back. The first thing is a common project. This is what democracy is about. Democracy is people saying that basically, yes, we want to live and fight and even die together. That's what democracy is about. It's called nation? I don't think so. It was called nation when democracy and nation were equated in the 19th century. Today, not so much. But democracy exactly is the problem. And the reason that we have a crisis in democracy is that we're not too sure anymore that we want to live, fight, and perhaps die together. All right, that's the first thing. And we need common places, agoras, forums, places where there is actually a democracy taking place. That, that is people talking to each other. And we know that a lot of the obstacles that we find are cultures, ling linguistic skills, but also the fact that we don't have, or we have only embryos of a common public sphere at European level places, I mean, some papers, some places. So, and I'm going to conclude on this very optimistic um, 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 note, um, as, uh, as Geremek would say, again, oh, this is good, as Geremek would say, um, as a, 
as a as an intellectual, I'm very pessimistic about the future, but as a politician, I'm very optimistic. So let's be optimistic. Um, the conference in the future of Europe has one big quality and one big flaw. The one big flaw is that it's very small in scale in spite of all its ambitions. But its greatest quality is that first of all, it exists and it exists and it's, it's probably, and I really hope so, this is the optimism in me, um, that it's going to have, to, to spawn a new kind of political debate at European level. Not just convents, not just discussions in expert circles, but real discussions beyond that. It's only, it's only now it's no, no longer a drop in the sea, it's a small drop of oil, but you know, it can spread and spread and spread. And this is the first thing that I'm, 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 I'm hoping for, that we collectively find the ways to build this transnational democracy in Europe. And that's the final part, because of all the reasons to build, um, a politically integrated Europe. The one that I think is not only desirable and necessary, but also um, absolutely beautiful to, to do is to build a transnational democracy. That is a democracy, which means basically upholding, defending and expanding our rights, not just the social, political, but also the, the cultural, environmental and civil war rights beyond the historical framework in which they have been developed, which is the nation state. And that's where I leave it. Thank you very much, Edouard. Um, so thank you for your provocative intervention, but also really excellent intervention, I would say. I will keep in mind two ideas. Um, and I think I will repeat those, of the, uh, those ideas. The fact that we don't have to teach Europe, but learn Europe, or that Europe has to be learned and not taught, because I think it's, it's exactly um, what we are trying to do um, at the moment in, in UEF. I know that I'm spamming you a little bit with our project. Uh, sorry, not sorry for that. But uh, UEF uh, decided to, to do this event, I mean, this project, which is called Make Europe Bloom. And it's actually, a, I would say, another drop in the sea um, to raise awareness on the conference on the future of Europe. Um, but it's actually about organizing forums, agoras, through art. So in this way, we would, you know, um, I mean, the, the linguistic part is always challenging, uh, as Eduard said. But with art, we think that perhaps we can communicate better. So that's what we are doing uh, at UEF at the moment. Um, we'll be in, we, we've been in Valencia in Spain for our first mural and we'll be in Greece and Estonia um, for our next stops. So stay tuned. Um, I've been informed that Mr. Lopez Aguilar has arrived. So welcome Mr. Lopez Aguilar. Uh, just so you know, we have with us 25 physical participants um, this is the final conference of UEF, um, the, the Democracies Europe, Remember to Revive. We had other three speakers with us today um, from the Commission, uh, from the European Commission side, and also from FEPS, from the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, and Edouard Godot, who is a historian who is here with us um, physically today. So. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon and I'll give you the floor now. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. I hope you can see me and you can hear me well. First of all, it's an honor to be part of this gathering and this conversation with the European Federalist Movement and to represent the case of the and the experience of the Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, which is the committee I chair and its involvement in all that deals with rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy, the European way. We have taken very seriously the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon and what it meant, along with the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union and what it meant with the same value as the treaties, the same legal value as the treaties, and it meant a lot, including, of course, the mandate, which is enshrined in the Treaty of the European Union, Article 6, of the European Union joining and, and the European Union accession to the 
European Convention of Human Rights, which means giving shape to this dialogue between the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice, making sure that the European Union is a beacon when it comes to rule of law, fundamental rights, and democracy, the European way. And I insist highlight the European way because first thing, Article 2 makes it clear that democracy for the European Union does not mean simple as that, rule by law or rule by majority is rule of law and protecting minorities and enshrining fundamental rights of the individual. Protecting minorities means respecting pluralism, respecting those who oppose you, those who are against you, those who criticize you when you're in government, and protecting those minorities who, which have every right to have an aspiration to become the majority of tomorrow. That is your, uh, democracy the European way. And we have taken that seriously, including the succession of every sort of crisis of which we come from, because ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force more than 10 years now, the European Union has endured a, a series of episodes of crisis, the Great Recession, the crisis of the sovereign debt, then the Brexit, then the so-called illiberal regimes in defiance of EU law and the primacy of EU law in defiance of EU values, and then the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, which has gave, uh, given, given rise to, to a series of emergency measures, which have actually restricted fundamental rights and the quality of democracy in a significant number of member states, which has also been a matter of concern by, by, by the Libre Committee, by the Committee I Chair. But I will simply share with you some views on the following items. First, the importance of raising awareness, mainstreaming the respect of fundamental rights and promoting compliance with EU legislation in every way and including the, the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. We have, of course, cared about the values enshrined in Article 2. We have cared about full compliance of Article 2 and we have launched the Article 7 procedures against two member states in which we have noticed a clear risk of a serious breach, systemic breach, a breach of systemic nature against the founding values of the European Union, including rule of law, fundamental rights and respect for democracy, the European way. We have also expressed concern about the regular complaint by these member states that they were finger pointed or discriminated against or somehow scapegoated. And uh, that is why we also set in motion nothing less than a comprehensive approach of EU rule of law monitoring across the European Union and including the, uh, the, the, the comprehensive uh, examination of all member states. That's what we have called democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights policy cycle, the so-called framework, framework, preventive, in order to make sure that the legal developments in the member states do also comply with the requirements of Article 2 and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So we have put in place the so-called annual monetary cycle of union values with a program which is meant exactly to serve that purpose. And ever since October 2020, we have seen the Commission presenting before the Libre Committee, actually Justice Commissioner Didier Reinders presenting before the Libre Committee, the so-called annual report, including country reports one by one, the 27 member states of the European Union, country reports as to its compliance with the rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy requirements of Article 2. That's what we call the so-called mechanism on democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights. And of course, you have to tell the difference, and we make the difference between those member states in which you may identify a clear risk of systemic breach of the values of the rule of law, fundamental rights, and democracy, and specific issues that need to be addressed in every individual member state. And we have to somehow discipline ourselves and accustom to ourselves in order to go through that thorough examination on a regular periodical basis on the grounds of objective parameters so that the usual rhetoric of being 
discriminated against or being scapegoated is called to a halt. And we all get accustomed that we all have to care on a permanent basis about the importance of the rule of law values. That is why we have put in place the rights and values programs adequately found. And we have put money into it. We have allocated money also to care about NGOs which play a role, a significant role as to their demands as to the government uh, level of the member states of the European Union to make sure that the cycle is fully implemented. A third point that I would like to share with you is that we also launched the so-called rule of law conditionality regulation. Nothing less. It's effective one year now. And it means that finally we drew the consequences of not compliance with the rule of law, fundamental rights, and democracy values, which is that you are prevented access to EU budgets, to EU funds. If you do not comply fully with the rule of law requirements, then you may be subject to a put on hold of the EU funds, including the recovery fund including the EU next generation, and that happens to be regrettably so, the case now of both Poland and Hungary. They have been put on hold precisely because of their defiance of EU law. It is notably the case of Poland, in which you have not only the notorious so-called LGBTI free zones, but also a latest development, including nothing less than an action filed by the Minister of Justice of the Polish government, which is personally himself the Prosecutor General, before the Polish Constitutional Court with the aim of making clear that the primacy of EU law is incompatible with the Polish Constitution. And that is also the case of a file, a legal case filed before the, European, uh, the, the Polish Constitutional Court in order to make clear that the European Convention of Human Rights is also incompatible with the Polish Constitution. And you know what? The Polish Constitution said exactly what the government wanted it to say, that both primacy of EU law, meaning the rulings of the European Court of Justice, which are in content of law on the, on the grounds of, of the uh, misbehavior of Polish government a number of times, and the European Convention of Human Rights are now denied its legal effect into Poland, its legal effect in Poland. That is a very challenging situation which should actually care of. And I have to mention that because I think that is an existential challenge for the European Union, for the European supranational integration, let alone say for the federalist perspective of going into a more perfect union, which was the proclaimed aim of the uh, constitutional cycle that brought about the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And finally, I would make a point on the importance of media, freedom, and protection of journalists. Media freedom, freedom of expression, has a corollary, which is media pluralism. And we have to care about media pluralism. If there's no media pluralism, if there's concentration of media or governmental control of the media, then you have every right to distrust the quality of that democracy. That is why we have also launched a number of initiatives in order to tackle the issue of what we have called a strategic litigation against journalists in order precisely to intimidate or to silence the right of free media to criticize gov the government and to be part of the shape up of a European process of free public opinion, which is of the essence for a democracy to deserve that name, to be worth of the name. Then there is the issue, of course, of the still pending accession to the European Convention of Human Rights. This European Parliament paved the way. We adopted the, uh, the uh, final outcome of the negotiation that took place in the first mandate of the European Parliament, in which the Lisbon Treaty entered into force. But there came the ruling of the European Court of Justice in 2013, saying that that negotiation was not sufficient, was not enough, and it had to be renegotiated, which is the process in which now the European Commission is involved and we preserve ourselves our final say, according to the Lisbon Treaty, 
a negotiation between the European Union and the European Convention of Human Rights needs the final votes, the final say of this European Parliament, and that will be the case, we will make sure that is our decision, the final one in this negotiating process, which is still underway. And the final point on the importance of the fundamental rights in the field of migration and equality and non-discrimination. It is a fact that uh, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights protects not only European citizens, but every human being on which EU law is to be implemented or applied for. So every time there is an implementation of EU law that affects an individual, that individual is protected by the European, by the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, whether he or she is a European citizen or a foreigner. That means also migrants and asylum seekers are uh, uh, subject to fundamental rights, including the right to asylum, Article 18, and the right of equality, Article 20, and non-discrimination on the grounds of race, gender, sexual orientation, belief, age, disability. There are certain criteria of discrimination which are expressly forbidden. And it's appalling that discrimination is on the rise following a number of tides that we have been seeing for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the latest years. For the recent years, we have seen, yes, a tide of discrimination, a tide of hate speech leading to hate crime, scapegoating minorities. It is the case of the Jewish communities. It is, of course, the case of the Roma community, which is a component element of the European social fabric of diversity and uniting diversity is precisely the motto of the European Union. We have to take good care of the importance of equal treatment, the right to equality, the anti-racial discrimination and the equality that employment discrimination, uh, equality employment directive, equal rights, equal treatment directive, which has been blocked for the council for the last 10 years, so that we care actually about the political dimension and the constitutional ambition that was somehow encapsulated, that was somehow uh, incorporated into the ambition of the Lisbon Treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So my concluding remark is that uh, uh, I personally and politically endorse fully the, 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 the federal ambition and the federal prospect of a European Union uh, growing global at the stature of its values, not in denial or in downgrading of its values, but actually at the stature of its values. I'm personally and politically convinced that there's nothing more harming, nothing more damaging, nothing more detrimental for the European Union credibility than a gap between its promise and its delivery. A gap between the values which are enshrined in EU law and facts and the actual behavior of the European Union institutions, let alone say the European member states, some of them, as it is notably the case, notoriously the case of Poland, in denial of EU values, in denial of the primacy of EU law. There is nothing more challenging existentially for the European Union than this trend that we have to fight back and, of course, to make sure that the EU political dimension and constitutional ambition finally prevails. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lopez Aguilar. Uh, it's a pleasure for us. And also thank you for the work that you did in the LIBE committee and your advocacy um, for the protection of rule of law and human rights. And also for, for our federalist ideas, because we know that you are a supporter of our ideas in the parliament. Um, I would like now to give the floor to the audience, to our students. Um, this is supposed to be a dynamic um, conversation now. So please feel free to ask for the mic. Yeah, Gustavo. Okay, yeah. yeah. 
Can you hear me okay? Well, first of all, thank you for, I mean, for such a great panel conversation also for the organization of the event. I mean, this is amazing. And so I have uh, one question which mixes a little bit both the abstract and then also kind of bring it to the ground because in the end being pragmatic is what it changes uh, the world. So I was wondering since, just to get some, some points all together, since we have discussed and we can see kind of the Europe idea is um, still in the making, the community is still in the making, and the European project, as we are Western people, we define by dichotomies and by opposition. So as long as we don't have an enemy or the concept, not, not an enemy, but an, op an, op an opposed concept, it's a difficult to understand ourselves, right? So in the last years, we have seen that the European project or the European idea has been in a way complemented with the anti-European narrative. Like in a way, uh, knowing what is counteracting you makes you improve. But at the same time, we have seen that this anti-European narratives has been, they have been enabled, uh, enabling political manipulation, which has had direct effects by undermining the rule of law and the values. So in a way to bring it to the ground, my question is, would be or would uh, including this kind of uh, anti-European narratives in the objective cleavages to trigger the Article 7 systemic, uh, or trigger basically the activation of the Article 7, confront with freedom of expression, is a could we include anti-European narratives as a reason to trigger the Article 7 to prevent first uh, the actual effects on the rule of law, and also if this would uh, in a way confront with freedom of expression, because if we also need to allow pluralism, we would it be in a way reasonable to allow anti-European narratives? Thank you. So uh, I'll take one more question. Um, it's from a participant online, Mr. Calm. Yes, the floor is yours. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, I'm calling from Luxembourg. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, there was a, a question about the focus on the project and not the values. But uh, the nature of the project is depending on the values. The question is not more to how to present values through the project. So I have a question in the same uh, direction. Um, first of all, <clears throat> we understand perhaps between us, but is the rule of flow easy to understand for people? If not, can people support EU? in opposition with their own government. How to obtain the support of people for the rule of law? Because if we don't have it, people can just choose their government against EU. This is my question. I can, I would say also something more personal. There is a big problem with values and my solution, personal solution, is to, to make a distinction between the values. You have some values we have, who are corresponding to diversity, which are identi ident identities values, I would say, which is what we call the diversity. They are not of the same uh, nature than the, the universal ones, uh, the, the, the human rights, on effectively the rule of law. So in the mind of people, these two kinds of values, they are mixed in the mind of government too, because the government, he wants to attract uh, the people in a democracy and he, he, he just wants to represent that. If these universal values are represented as a national value, people don't always understand that in fact they are European. I'm not going so far because there is a problem of the universality, and that's why we are European, because we think that there is a, a, a level we must first reach between something perhaps 
which would be the end of humanity. So I'm stopping. This was just a remark on the nature of the values and the confusion we are making in our mind between what, in what we are different, that means cultural and identity values, and the common values we are speaking of for the rule of world. Excuse, excuse me, I, I, I hope I'm not a bit too long. Thank you very much. So I think um, the last question is addressed to Edouard, perhaps. Yes, I mean, your intervention was a bit provocative. So of course, yeah, no, no it makes sense. Uh, and then I think the first question, yes, whoever wants to address the first question um, is more than welcome. So Edouard, perhaps, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer both. I'm happy to answer neither. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really up to you. Um, um, uh, let's start with that last question. I mean, sir, um, I, I hope I understand correctly what you're saying. And if I'm not, please forgive me and correct me. But I think that you give yourself um, in the question and the personal comment at the very end, what the problem is and why I said not focus on the value, but on the community, on the project. Because you said is yourself, you're starting to pick on the values. Say, oh, well, I like this one. I don't like that one. Or maybe that one is not exactly the best because that one, you know, I'm the, the rights of minorities. Well, maybe it's secondary compared to human rights. But frankly, this is exactly what for long the political systems were defending against women's right to vote because it was just not in the in the political system. So I don't think we're taking us taking that path would lead us where you want to and where we want to, which is a politically integrated community. We need to have within the community of values, a discussion on values, on all the values, including the one we find absolutely loathe, the ones we don't like, the ones we hate. And this is why I'm, I'm scared when I hear that we should trigger Article 7 for anti-European narratives. Frankly, do we want Europe and the European Union to become the Soviet Union, because that's exactly where it would lead us. I'm not saying this is it, but that's exactly where it would lead us. So we would just give right to all those anti-European narratives that say that they traded Moscow for Brussels, which leads me to uh, uh, being extremely uh, um, uh, ironic on this, but I remember Romano Prodi saying to Václav Klaus, who was claiming exactly that, that Moscow and Brussels were the same thing. Say, remind me of the date of your accession demand to the Soviet Union. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. When I'm talking about project, when I'm talking about community, and it's not in spite of values, not beyond values, but just in which we have a discussion on values, in which we have a political discussion. I want politics. That means democracy. I want this and not politicking. As in, I defend my party because it's my party. Look at what's happening today in, in the, the, the questioning of the court of auditors. Who's siding with, the, with, the, with the, the head of the court of auditors? His political family. Where are the values here? See, values is, is a word that is way too difficult to establish once and for good, even though it's in the European treaties, and that's a good start. But there are many ways also to interpret. Mohamed Mahathir, the prime minister of, of, um, of, of Malaysia for a long time, used to say, you know what? Asian values are universal. European values are European. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to start a discussion on this. What I'm saying is that the discussion on values is a discussion that can lead us to places where we don't want to go. One of them being exactly what you described. Another one being starting to pick on values, the ones we like, the ones we don't, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that we should do that. We should ask the question and answer that question. What does it mean to be in a political community together, including and especially when we have disagreements on values? Thank you very much, Eduard. Any reactions from Anya, our the other speakers? I think Juan Lopez was before me. Yes. Okay. No. If I may. Yes, of course. If I may speak. Yes. Well, actually, there were some points made about 
Article 7 procedure and about the background of Article 7 procedure, believe me that Article 7 procedure would have never been triggered or activated if there would have been just one individual ground or an individual consideration. If Article 7 has been triggered by the European Parliament, both in the Hungarian case 2016 and in the Polish case 2018, is precisely because there was not only one consideration, but a full, a full, a full understanding of the compound of the deterioration, actually the constitutional breakdown that has been taking place in both countries, following the decisions being made by a single absolute majority in parliament in a very short period of time. Of course, the strategy of these two governments, both the Hungarian ultranationalist and the hyper-conservative far-right government and the Polish government has always been trying to somehow cut in pieces the overall analysis and single out every individual issue so that they can compare that situation with some other member state. Let's see this institution somehow resembles the situation of this particular institution, this other member state, and this other institution uh, somehow resembles the reform that was taking place in some other member state. The point is that in a very short period of time, in a very limited number of years, and following the decisions of a single absolute majority in parliament and a single government, there has been a constitutional strategy in order to produce what we have called the constitutional breakdown, in which no piece of the constitutional architecture has been left aside. All of them has been affected or intoxicated by the decisions being made by an absolute majority. And what is the background of it? The background is a defiance of the very concept of democracy, which is the European idea of democracy. They always reply, these decisions are democratic because they were supported by the majority in parliament. And we have responded time and again. Democracy in Europe has never been confined simply to have a majority in parliament. It always entails respect for minorities, respect for the procedural rights of minorities, respect for the right of minorities to amend the legislative initiatives taken by the government, respect of, of, of the independence of the judiciary so that the judiciary is to review the decision taken by executives. And of course, respect for the independence of the constitutional court if there's a constitutional court, which is the case, because the constitutional court has the competence to review the constitutionality of the laws being adopted by the parliament. And the point I'm making here is that that deterioration is the corollary of a, an anti-European narrative, which all too often has said, I've said it, I've heard it before, this European Union is, over, is, is behaving like the Soviet Union, and the European Parliament is behaving like the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union. They are trying to overrun our national identity, our national sovereignty, our national capacity and, and, and sovereignty to take decisions being legitimized by our national parliaments. That's not the European way. And of course, that is the corollary of, a, of, a, of an anti-European narrative. So Article 7, is not based on anti-European narratives. It's, Article 7 is the consequence, the outcome of many years of anti-European narratives, actually Europhobic narratives, going anti-European. And there are so many examples that would appall you. Every time the European Parliament has sent a delegation, both to Hungary and Poland, they have been mistreated as, they, as, as, as if they were the European Parliament delegation, as if they were some kind of interference of a foreign power. And they have been disqualified by the media dominated and controlled by the, by the government as something of the kind of an alien in interference into the national sovereignty of both member states. That means an actual denial of what the European integration is about, of what European law means, and of course, the final, the final frontier, the, 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 the ultimate frontier that we have seen violated is precisely the defiance of the primacy of EU law. We had never seen anything of the kind. Of course, we have seen decisions being made by some certain national constitutional courts, somehow putting shades to uh, 
to, to, to the incorporation of EU law into or transposition of EU law into national law, but never a decision being made by a, by a, by a, by a constitutional court in a member state in defiance of the primacy of EU law. They have said, no, oh, the, the, the German constitutional court did the same thing. It's not true. The German constitutional court put on hold a certain program by the central bank buying per, the purchasing program of, of debt of certain member states, which is not primary law, but the so-called derivated law, secondary law, but never in defiance of the primacy of EU law. And finally, the problem was overcome by the German constitutional court itself. So we have never seen anything of the kind. We have a situation which is extremely challenging and has an existential dimension. But having said this, yes, we have to stand up against anti-European and Europhobic narratives. We must not overlook the potential of anti-European narratives. And it's not a matter of turning a blind eye and ignoring them. It's a matter of facing and standing up to the defiance narrative uh, that uh, is challenging the European integration. Because if we do not stand up for EU values, they will simply be downgraded. They will be eroded and deteriorated passively. We cannot allow ourselves that to happen. The European Union is a very fragile uh, uh, experience. It's, it's a big magnitude, but very fragile. And if we let it to be eroded, there will be no turning, no turning back. If we want to uh, keep up the credit and the credibility of the European process, we need to stand up for those values. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anya raised her hand, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps building on what uh, uh, Juan Lopez uh, already started uh, uh, alluding to, honestly speaking, the comparison and the language that even dares to compare European Union to the Soviet Union makes me extremely, extremely angry, because I think that it is as ignorant as possible to even imply that something that uh, European Union is doing could be leading into anything close that the Soviet Union has been as an experience. And maybe I'm speaking as a Pole who was born and someone said, you know, the age matters. I have seen the transition in my country. I've seen how difficult transition has been, but the choice to come and to be the member of the European Union. And I was um, campaigning like as a, you know, 20 plus something student. It was an informed decision and it was the decision, a part of transition in Poland that decided to go on a democratic way that adopted in the referendum, the constitution of 1997 that was putting the country on the democratic way. And it was part of a social compromise of a social decision of a civic decision, empowered civic decision to be part of the European Union. And what I do believe is that we can't be casual about the values. It's not about picking and choosing. This is what makes the system of the European Union values work because they work together. You can't have equality without democracy and you can't have democracy without equality. You can't have democracy without freedoms. This is beginning and the end of everything. And I do not agree that people do not discuss values because they are too difficult and untangible. The translation of the values is in policies. But if you start from policies without the agreement on the values, the policies will get you into very wrong direction. For me, you start with the values because that's the way you think. This is the way how you identify yourself. This is the way you come to be part of a community that you want to have the sense of belonging. Furthermore, I think that you know when we talk about the understanding and if people understand in the EU, I stood in the election twice. And my experience with the European Union discussion, and you know, it was in the times that also I was standing for the center left, center left 2004 was particularly unpopular in Poland. But you get to meet the citizens who are dissatisfied with many different things and they want to discuss politics. And it is not if they, if they want to know what exactly is the co-decision, what is the mandate of the European Parliament, but what they want to know is that the European Union has their well-being, prosperity, freedoms at the heart, and that the people elected to be part of the European Union decision-making process are going to act accordingly to the principle, which only reinforces the argument that the values is what is at the core and what, what defines us and what matters. And as much as I agree, you know, enjoy 
Eduardo's uh, discussion about the historical things and that the Europe has complex history. Everybody does. But while setting up the European Union as a peace project, as a welfare project, as project oriented on the people, as the project we would like to see growing to be the federal one, we've made a conscious choice to leave the past in the past, to learn from mistakes and to build something better for in the future for the current generation and for us now. Now, when we come to the issue of uh, also Poland, and that will be my uh, last thing, I don't think it's a matter of interpretation. I mean, the rule of law is very, very straightforward. Judges need to be independent. They can't be persecuted. They can't be politically put under pressure. The judicial independence is fundamental and everybody has a right to a free process, to a fair free process. This is what the people have been protesting about. And the problem, and uh, Juan Lopez has been you know, alluding on that and we spoke about the misbehavior, the narratives and all that. The problem is that we cannot slip and let the countries choose when and how they interpret democracy because the current Polish government has about 600 casualties daily because of COVID. And what they are saying is we cannot put restrictions because it's unpopular. We would be undemocratic putting restrictions. But at the same time, women protest. At the same time, civic protest against the changes of the Constitutional Tribunal, they ignore. You can't apply this kind of understanding. Democracy is about respecting minorities, respecting the opinions, respecting those, as Juan Lopez said, who might come into power, but it's above all respecting the principles and principle of democracy is the one that you have to make sure that the country is the one that represents, deliberates and come to the conclusive and for the benefit of everyone without harming the basic principles and basic values. So in that sense, I mean, being a Polish citizen, and of course, you know, I, I am Brussels based, so of course, European Union and, the, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of transnational politics. That's perhaps more of a niche discussion. But at the same time, the fundamental issue of belonging, being part of the European Union, not as secondhand and second class citizens, but as the full ones is at the essence of what Polish citizens still believe. And that's why they are Euro enthusiastic. And the alternative, I mean, the moment we have the procedures three year, how really, seriously speaking, and that's what we should be picking up as an argument, how much of a self-determination you can have when you leave the decision-making room and when you stand behind that or out of that without the decision-making power, seriously. I mean, that's a proper argument to make and we should not shy away from those debates. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, we don't have much time, but I have two more questions. The first one from Esther. Yes, you have the yes. floor. Um, I come from Budapest, Hungary. I just wanted to reflect uh, on this value issue. Uh, there has to be a clear distinction that rule of law is uh, a basic value in the sense that it has clear criteria. It's not uh, open to interpretation. If you read the reports, the rule of law report about Hungary that was made last July, July 21, you can see all the four criteria where we breach, where Hungary, uh, the checks and balances are dismantled, where there is no media freedom, there is no uh, plurality, there is no uh, independence of judges, etc. So, and what is Orban's narrative whenever he gets an attack uh, based on, like, say, rule of law mechanism? He says that he is ideologically or on a he is attacked on a political ground. And that's exactly where we should not go because it is, it is not true. Because he is going for a one party state to build up a one party state and to, many, to dominate all the fields of life, to, money, to, to dominate all the checks and balances. And this is not ideology. He has the source of ideology over on top, a nationalist ideology, because he needs an outside enemy which is Brussels in this sense, that, that has to be, that he's the big protector of the state. This is the basic populist idea. So we should not say that rule of law is up to interpretation because that's uh, what uh, our minister of justice is answering always, that there is no such a definition like rule of law. There is no clear criteria, but there is one. So that would be my uh, comment. Sorry, it's not a question. Thank you very much, Esther. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I also have a comment, but it ends with a question, in fact. 
and the comment is related very much to this discussion concerning again what trigger article seven and at the same time also again this comparison which is fairly popular among autocrats uh, again especially from the former soviet space uh between eu and ussr and um, to an extent if i may um i don't know read among the lines of what uh, edward said i don't necessarily think that he said that the EU is the like the USSR, but basically implied that that's the <laughs> type of discussion, type of narrative that autocrats, growing autocrats use. Exactly. Um, but uh, two points on this. Of course, again, there is no need to stress the, the big difference. Today we were at the uh, House of European History. We had a look at the, at the headlines when Estonia was basically occupied by the Soviet Union, jubilant masses welcomed the delegation of Estonia returning from Moscow now finally member of the USSR, clearly uh, the, previous the previous government was sent to Siberia or killed, and basically there was no choice, no vote, many people would be deported and so on and so forth, there is no comparison. But one point uh, on which I agree with Edward is, yes, I mean, I believe that to a certain extent, we should focus on the community as much as on the values. Um, I, I believe that, let's say, sticking each of us to our own little castle of values kind of nice safe spaces and you know not having even a bit of a discussion about the values is detrimental to the community itself um so i think that this is important but i also believe that uh what happens when one member of the community by not playing by the rules which were agreed rules very much does not create an issue only for itself but runs the risk of sinking the entire community I mean, I'm referring, for example, to what happened with the ruling of the Polish court. I mean, this is something that very much undermines the, the consistency of the European Union, the way in which the European Union works. So if we just say this is a, a Polish issue, well, again, it's not just a Polish issue, it undermines the entire construction that we have built over 60 years. And, and, and the other thing that I believe uh, this, in fact, was misunderstood is that Article 7 was not called because of, let's say, Eurosceptic narratives or because somehow a government didn't really like certain aspects of the European Union. It was called somehow because there were serious issues, not of narratives, but of acts against the rule of law and against the rights of citizens, Polish citizens, Hungarian citizens, and in fact, EU citizens. And in fact, my final question is like, uh, and that is the question, if it is about the political community and the fact that one member of that co political community runs the risk of sinking the entire community with its acts against the rules that it agreed to stand by. Uh, what do we do? Take, uh, uh, again, the case of Poland that we were discussing. Po there will be no poll exit. Uh, Polish government has no intention to leave uh, the EU. Uh, it's a completely different story in the UK. We don't get rid of that problem. Uh, Polish citizens are very much attached, and rightly so, to European Union, European Union benefits and so on and so forth. So how do we deal with someone that doesn't want to leave, but doesn't play by the rules of the games and risk undermining the entire machine? And I think that in this sense, Article 7 is, is even too soft. Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, any reactions from the speakers? If you allow me, because I know we're running out of time. Yes, I myself we are running out of, out of time. So very briefly, but, but I, have I, 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 would, I, I wouldn't refrain me from commenting that I can only regret that increasingly so within the ranks and lines of the European debate within the European Parliament, you heard voices. There is a failure in the system, in the EU system, because in the Treaty of the European Union, we have provisions for accession to the European Union. Article 48. We have provisions to review the treaties, Article 49. We have provisions to exit the EU, Article 50. But we have no provisions to expose, to expel a misbehaving member, a dysfunctional member, a reluctant member in non-compliance with EU law. And I'm saying that I can only regret that debate, which is a rising tide because it's an expression of a general malaise about to these misbehaving member states. My personal opinion is that that would be no solution because we have to protect the European citizenship of that majority within Hungary and Poland, which want to stick to European values, want to belong to the European Union, want to stay European. We have to protect the European citizenship. And my response 
to those governments which mistreat the European Parliament as a foreign interference. The European Parliament is no foreign power in Hungary and Poland. It actually represents directly and democratically the European citizenship of both 10 million Hungarians, Hungarians and 40 million Polish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anya raised her hand, so the floor is yours. And uh, unless any other of the panelists, yes, because I'm, I'm, fair, I'm taking the floor the second time. Yes. So yeah, yeah, I can say something after you, Anya. Go ahead. Okay. Um, just uh, you know, on the argument that we don't discuss value, I actually think that the, you know, when you take Poland or Hungary or even Slovenia, we discussed European unions and values continuously on an everyday basis. I mean, today there was a vote inside of the uh, Polish Parliament about. Uh, a brutal law to make all the pregnant women, even at the early stage of pregnancy, be under the condition of registering the pregnancy and, uh, uh, you know, having to explain, uh, even in case of miscarriage, what happened to that. That's the part of the discussion, you know, whose life we are to protect and, you know, the big discussion on the abortion. LGBTQI uh, community, I mean, in case of Hungary and Poland, we keep on discussing that. We keep on discussing the right of people to be who they are, to be lost for who they are, and to live without persecution, to live in an egalitarian manner. Uh, we are discussing the question of migration. We are discussing the, you know, TVN legs, um, the question of media freedom, the issue of uh, migration, the question on the border crisis. What does it mean to be part of the European Union and act together? What does it mean to act in a humanitarian faith? So I would not agree, essentially, we are not discussing the values. I think that we are discussing them in a very, very tangible way and putting the benchmarks very, very strong. And the European Union's action, and as uh, you know, it has been said, has to be even bolder, even stronger, if we are to defend them and give the courage you know, into the fight that is so exhausting for those Polish citizens who believe in the European Union and who believe that our place is as a part of constructing and not destructing the community that has such peace, prosperity and wealth of such a long time. Thank you, Anya. Uh, Mr. Bell, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. I would just like to um, uh, echo the, the comment made uh, by Esther from the audience about the, uh, the concept of the rule of law, which defines the, rule, the rules of our cooperation in the European Union as well. I fully agree with uh, Esther that uh, the core of the principle of the rule of law is very clear and there's consensus about it. It is about equality before the law. It is about judges that have to be independent in order to apply the law and uphold fundamental rights. It's about separation of powers. And it's about, of, it's about avoiding arbitrary exercise of executive power. And these core principles are shared by the European Court of Justice, by the European Court of Human Rights. And they are the rules that govern our cooperation and that make our European project possible. And we need to work together, EU institutions, member states, stakeholders, civil society, to fight for these values and fight for the rule of law. And I think the Conference on the Future of Europe is uh, a very um, important um, uh, development, a very uh, important democratic experiment that allows us to shape our European project with citizens, civil society, member states, and national parliaments and the European Parliament. And um, this is uh, a project of which I hope to see um, a very, very um, good outcome next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now the floor is yours. Well, well I'll, I'll yeah. still two minutes of your yes. time uh, more. Um, also, because I'm, I'm also kind of responsible to, for lighting this fire, but I, I think it's very enjoyable in, in some way. Um, just a few points to not to clarify my position, because I think that I, I don't think that anyone um, would suspect me of uh, agreeing with um, all the, the 
bad guys that we're talking about. Just a few things, just to frame it. First of all, uh, what we're seeing in Poland and Hungary is not just in Poland and Hungary. This is absolutely European. In my country, in 2017, of the seven, the 12 candidates that were running for president, only two and a half were actually uh, pro-European. Well, it's one of them who won, so everything's fine. No, it's not. It's not, and it's going to be even worse because the half one is going to be off in the next uh, in the next run up because it was Francois Fillon who was very sovereignist in some way, but he, his political family is just drifting to the extreme right even more. So this is a general trend. And if I if I may just also on my country in 2005, there was a big trauma that was called a referendum. And nothing has been done in the French society in, in for real to address the, the bridge, sorry, to bridge that, that widening gap between what we stand for, which is basically a politically integrated Europe, and the level of the, uh, of the political debate. Second of all, I think that what we're seeing today um, in the dismantling of the rule of law and the, uh, and the state sorry, and the, the, the independent state is not also just um, a Polish and, and Hungarian problem. This is also something that I've heard in the debate in my country. And just, I'm taking mine, but we, can, we could find other examples. It is something that, uh, I mean, basically we are footing the bill of a complacent time that um, uh, our, our distinguished MEP, um, uh, Jose Lopez Aguilar, just said, we haven't fought enough or well enough the entire narrative, uh, the entire European narratives for a long time. There was a sense of complacency. We pro-Europeans, and uh, you probably understood the we, we pro-Europeans were in the sense of history. We had nothing to fear. Everything was going fine. And then suddenly, the hydra of fascism is coming back and we don't know how to deal with it. It is a bit late, the problem. That's, that's why we're running to put up the fire. We're putting up the fire because we didn't see it start or we didn't address the little sparks when it started. And now we're, find, we're, find, we're trying to find ways to put it off without fueling it. And that's where I wanted to land. When I said that we need to focus on the community and not the values, I had I was like miles away of thinking that I would um, that would lead to a question of with it is it legitimate to question women's rights? I mean, honestly, um, no. What I'm saying is that a political project is exactly what we need to fight for. The reason why fascists and I'm I'm not afraid of the world because of the world because this is exactly what we're dealing with right now, all over Europe. Um, what, we, what we're dealing with is, is with a very understandable project, a political project that is attractive. If you've seen Fight Club, you will understand that at some point fascism can be very attractive, especially to young people. Okay, so I'm not saying that uh, fascism, is, fascism is good, I'm saying that a lot of people find it nice. And that's the problem that we are dealing with today. And that's why we need something a little bit less um, uh, disincarnated than just like naming and blaming, and something that really means something about the European project, something that that can bring into democratic debate, uh, not just the the outraged um, um, way with a lot of us, not all of us, of course, thank God, but a lot of us have reacted to the rise of anti-European narratives or europhobic narratives, dismissing them as being petty. And you know, in the end, it's the deplorable who won in 2016 in the US. It's also kind of the deplorable, you see, you, you see the reference, that won in 2016 in Brexit. And I'm scared, really scared, that the deplorable would win also in my country. So once again, what I'm rising, what I'm pointing at, when I'm talking about community, it's the reason why we want to live together. And the European Union is one of them. Uh, we need to be a little bit more specific sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the speakers. I mean, we have run out of time. I would be happy to, you know, to give you the floor again, but uh, I guess that you all have commitments professional and personal commitment.